There we go. Good evening. This is the September 14th meeting of the John Birch Society in Corpus Christi, Texas. Uh, my name is John Rowland. I am giving a talk this evening on nullification and how it may be an effective method of addressing many of our concerns for political reform. First, however, let's get into something of the background of nullification. It was first proposed in its modern form by Thomas Jefferson in the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798 and 1799. What had happened in seven, earlier in 1798 was that Congress, under one party, the party opposed to Jefferson and Madison, and under the influence of John Adams, President John Adams of the time, passed a, a couple, a several pieces of a, a legislation called collectively the Alien and Sedition Acts. The, the most important of which were the Sedition Acts, because they made it a crime to criticize government officials. And it was used against several of the leading newspapers of the time, including the Philadelphia Aurora, which was published by uh, a guy named Beige, who was the grandson and heir of Benjamin Franklin, and he had to go into hiding because they were trying to get him. And they did convict us, some, several people. Now, uh, it also led to uh, mailboxes being opened, mail being stolen. Uh, Jefferson and Madison actually had to resort to communicating in code because they were concerned about their mail being opened uh, and it being used against them. So it was, there was a kind of a reign of oppression that began to develop, develop very early in our country's history. Well, the way that Madison and Jefferson responded to it was to try to organize resistance at the state level in two adjacent states, Virginia and the new state of Kentucky. Uh, Jefferson worked on Kentucky and Madison worked on Virginia. There was uh, one set of resolutions in e each state in 1798. There was a second set in Kentucky in 1799 and a document not called Resolutions but the Re Virginia Report written by Jeff Madison which appeared in 1800. Uh, this, these documents, especially the uh, Kentucky Resolutions of 1799, call for the states to mount an organized resistance to unconstitutional federal actions, in particular the Alien and Sedition Acts. Now this was not joined by other states. Uh, there was a lot of sympathy in other states. Some of them outright rejected it, uh, the ones that were in favor of the Alien and Sedition Acts, mainly in the Northeast. But uh, the idea was planted and is thought to have had a major influence on the election of 1800 in which Jefferson was elected president. And when he was elected president, he also came, brought in his supporters, uh, then called the, the Democratic Republicans, which later became the Democratic Party. The opposing party of Adams and Hamilton, called the Federalist Party, lost so many seats that they actually collapsed as a party. They stopped offering candidates in most elections. So the Jeffersonian party dominated for the next 24 years through two terms of Jefferson, two
two by Madison and two of James Monroe. And during this period that the Jeffersonian model for interpretation of the Constitution became established. And of course it wasn't just Jeffersonian, it was also Madisonian and a lot of their friends, but it's usually called Jeffersonian just because he was the first of the series of three presidents. And of course he did write a lot of the key material. Now, as it turns out, because of the election of 1800, they didn't really have to follow through on state-level resistance. The election was the resistance. By winning the election, uh, the Alien and Sedition Acts, some of which were due to expire anyway in 1800, expired or were, you know, uh, uh, repealed, and Jefferson immediately pardoned all the people who had been prosecuted under those acts. So uh, he undid a lot of the damage, and he and the others were able to consolidate the, the win without having to actually have done nullification as an act of state-led civil disobedience. But the idea continued to percolate, to be remembered, and later on it was used against Jefferson himself uh, when he tried to keep the United States out of war by uh, imposing an embargo on uh, ocean trade with Europe. The people in New England were so upset with that that they threatened nullification uh, against his policies. It, later on it came to a head in 1832 when the northern states managed to get heavy tariffs imposed on imports of European manufacturers, which was intended to encourage the development of uh, merchants and, fa and factory owners in the North, but which had a severe impact on southern plantations, who were accustomed to being able to buy a lot of manufactured goods from Europe at lower prices than they could get them from the New England states. And at this point you already began to see a pattern where uh, southern plantation owners were going heavily into debt, mostly debts to northern bankers, sometimes foreign bankers, but northern bankers, and discovering that if their prices were greatly increased, they wouldn't be able to pay their, make their mortgage payments. So South Carolina legislature uh, adopted a bill calling for the nullification of the federal tariff. Now in those days, federal agents had to depend on local state agents to enforce most federal laws. Uh, so the threat by South Carolina in this case to refuse to cooperate with the collection of federal tariffs would effectively prevent them from being collected. Um, the, the, this was called the Nullification Crisis of 1832, and Congress responded by backing off, by reducing the tariff to a very fairly low value, and South Carolina backed off in turn, in turn to avoid a confrontation. Um, later on, the southern states would secede after their efforts of nullification were met by other efforts of nullification on the northern side over a range of issues. Fugitives, slaves were one, uh, tariffs were another. Some considered tariffs to be the most important, but 
whatever importance one might attribute to the various um, causes, the southern states thought that the Constitution was being violated by Congress making laws that favored one section over another. The General Welfare Clause, although it's, it's been, since been grossly misinterpreted, was intended to forbid any law which favored one state or section or faction over another. It was intended, any such laws and tax taxation in particular were intended to be, to fall evenly on everybody, either directly by who was collected from and how much and indirectly on who ultimately was impacted by the effect of it. Um, the imposition of, of the amounts and the uh, targets was written into the Constitution. Um, that's what, un what uniform system of ta taxation meant. What was not really written into the Constitution, which, which was implied, was of forbidding the impact of taxes to fall disproportionately on one part of the country over, the, over another. And uh, possibly if language had been put in the Constitution to that effect at the beginning, that crisis could have been avoided, but uh, it was left out and the crisis developed with the tragic consequences we saw. Now, nullification was never completely forgotten, but it fell into abeyance as a rallying cry for a long time thereafter. Ever so often it would be revived, and there was always a tendency for uh, some states to resist federal legislation or federal actions and often doing so successfully, usually however without invoking the word nullification. Um, but with recent developments the word is being revived and it has led to a somewhat a complicated situation because most people today do not really know the historical background and there's a tendency when they hear the word nullification or nullify to expect too much of it in the sense that they can somehow say the word you know we nullify at the state level and suddenly it will solve all the problems nullify and nullification are not magic words. By themselves they don't change anything. What they do is invoke civil disobedience. And we have a fundamental problem that if the majority is determined to impose some policy on the minority and the courts are, don't support the rights of individuals who go up to court to try to protect those rights, then the only thing we're left with is determined minorities resisting the will of the majority by impeding it at every opportunity, by refusing to cooperate with it, by engaging in acts of civil disobedience, or by other means, perhaps creative ones, of so impeding the efforts of uh, the majority to impose its will that they by interposing their resistance to effectively block it. Uh, this is sometimes called in politics a veto block. Veto blocks can take various forms, but they're generally minorities who have the ability to block things even though they may not have the power to adopt them. And our system of government 
under the Constitution was actually designed to make it fairly easy for veto blocks to emerge to block the will of the majority and force the development of a consensus of a supermajority in which the rights of minorities or even individuals are recognized and protected. So that's the situation we have now. As a lot of people have discovered who try to go to court to deal with infringements on the Constitution, uh, the courts are largely unwilling to recognize those rights. And they've invented various doctrines like standing to our political question to effectively say to people, look, we don't want you coming to us with every uh, claim that results from your failure to win a majority in Congress. Okay? If you can't win in the political arena, we don't want you coming to us to try to achieve a victory for you that you couldn't win there. So for a lot of these issues, we're simply either not going to decide them or may, may even decide them against you. Uh, if you want solutions, organize your friends and neighbors and go out and win in the, elect, the next elections. Um, and there's some merit in taking that position, but it's not really a sound position from the viewpoint of the way that the judiciary uh, was set up by the Constitution. Because the, it was the original intention of the Constitution and the way it set up the judiciary that they would be able to take all of these cases to what's to do what is sometimes called private prosecution of a public right. We see this the legacy of this in several writs called prerogative writs, such as habeas corpus, quo Ranto, and so forth, in which any citizen may go to court with a demand called a writ and force the an official to prove his authority for doing something or not doing something. In the case of habeas corpus, it's his authority to hold a prisoner. In the case of quo Ranto, it's his authority to do anything, including holding the office. Now, when this, in the early decades of this re republic, there was not a lot of use made of either of these writs. Uh, they were used more in England and came over from our English experience. <coughs> During the first hundred years or so of the United States, they almost never had to be used because their availability kept officials in line. They learned early on that if they stepped out of line that any citizen could go to court and put them in line. So they tended to avoid infringing on the Constitution. However, the knowledge of these remedies faded. They weren't, they stopped being taught in law schools. They didn't come up often in the experience of practicing lawyers and judges. And they began to forget all about them or how they were supposed to work. Uh, I have taken, you know, presented writs of habeas corpus to judges, uh, some of whom have served for decades and have never seen a habeas corpus. They didn't know what to do with it. So, and they didn't get taught about it in law school. Law schools don't teach how to handle it. So, uh, <clears throat> we have a problem of institutional memory fading. You know, the, the old saying is that uh, civilization is only one generation away from barbarism because we keep having to tr teach each new generation 
what has been learned in previous generations. And it's very easy to neglect to teach something if it's not an active issue. And it, if, it ceases, if it stops being an active issue for, for a couple of generations, they may forget about it altogether and people will have to go back to old law books to try to dig it up again. And part of what I've tried to do with my website, constitution.org, is to dig up all these old legal documents that teach this stuff. So that people can go to it and find out about it, find out, learn things that are not taught in law schools, that in many cases cannot even be found in law libraries, even some of the best ones, and bring it forward so people can see how things were originally supposed to work. Now, what is the relevance of nullification today? The problem is that for nullification to work, it's not enough for a few individuals to engage in civil disobedience. Now, during the Civil Rights Movement, we saw a lot of individuals engaging in civil disobedience. We saw it again in the anti-war movement, the environmental movement, and so forth. And the numbers of disobedient citizens began to become great enough that it had an impact. It eventually won the support of larger and larger numbers of the population until they be began to win elections. Um, I remember that time I was invited to go on some of the freedom rides in uh, the, the South at that period uh, and I declined to do so because I wasn't willing to take a vow of nonviolence. I was raised in the militia tradition of Texas and if I saw violence occurring in my presence, uh, my instincts, my training, were, would be to intervene to protect the innocent person. And the position of the movement organizers is that even if people are going to get killed, it's better to let them get killed, you know, for the sake of the cause. So I wasn't prepared to let things go that far, you know. It's one thing to turn your, your own cheek quite another thing to watch someone else being beaten to death in front of you. And I wasn't about to stand by and let that happen. But even so, I supported the movement uh, and a lot of some good things, some bad things grew out of it, including, some, fortunately, some unconstitutional legislation although it, even though unconstitutional may have done some good. So, we've had various forms of civil disobedience. Now Gandhi himself uh, was once asked by Margaret uh, Rourke, the photographer and journalist, about it, and he explained that nonviolence was not a religious principle. It was a tactic. It was a tactic that was designed to be used against British rule of India. And it, it would work because the British were basically decent chaps. He explained that it would never have worked against the Russians. So, a lot depends on who you're up against. If you're up against basically decent chaps, and an environment in which the public will side with you if you're, they see you as an underdog, if they see you being beaten up, then civil disobedience can be a very useful tactic for winning public support. A much more effective tactic than just standing up on a soapbox and, you know, haranguing people. Uh, sometimes there has, blood has to be spilled in order to get the public to become aroused. Uh, that's unfortunate, but uh, 
in an age in which we become inured to violence, or we see it on television every day, it's not enough for a guy to conduct a hunger strike, or even five or ten or a hundred. Uh, you know, if a guy uh, starves himself to death, that might arouse a few people, but it will no longer arouse the large numbers that it once could. could. So now we are faced with a problem that if we are going to make civil disobedience work, we need to organize it on a much larger scale than just a few individuals, or even a, a fervent movement. So how can we do that? Well, Jefferson pointed the way. Go to a state legislature, win the support of state legislators, to adopt legislation that has the effect of impeding the unconstitutional federal actions. Now, there are a lot of ways to do that. There are also a lot of ways not to do that. It depends a lot on, on what the federal action is. The two most often cited examples of nullification that have occurred in recent years, and in fact are still going on, are first, the Real ID Act, and second, medical marijuana. The Congress passed the Real ID Act, which required states to modify their, uh, the ID they issued for driver's licenses and for state ID purposes to conform to federal standards, essentially to enable the feds to use the states as its tools for achieving a national identification system without the feds themselves issuing the identification cards. <laughs> um, the states resisted because for one thing, this, the feds weren't funding it. Uh, the feds took the position that if you don't conform, if you don't make your ID conform to our standards, uh, your citizens won't be able to uh, enter federal courthouses or get on airplanes or do other things that where we're exercising control. A lot of the says, states said, okay, okay, so they can't get into those things. You're really not going to be able to stop them all. Let's, you know, be serious about this. And we are not going to spend our money to implement your standards. So a lot of states refused to appropriate the money for it. Texas was one of them. The res as a result of this resistance by so many states, the, Re the Real ID Act, although still on the books, has become a dead letter. It's been missing all of its deadlines for implementation. Almost no state is in full compliance, and at this point it doesn't look like any of them ever will be. So, uh, this is a, a, an excellent example of nullification as a method. The other method, the other example is a little more indirect. Uh, in a lot of the states, citizens demanded and got state laws legalizing marijuana for medicinal purposes. There are a lot of people who suffer from various ailments for which medic, mar, marijuana is the only known treatment. Uh, some of it is a matter of life and death. Uh, there actually have been people who, when deprived of marijuana, died. Uh, because of the severe need for people, a few people like this, the states legalized it, which put them in direct conflict with the federal government. The, the feds were trying to enforce their statutes making illegal the possession of marijuana, even if it was needed for medicinal purposes, and the states were saying, no, 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 uh, we're authorizing physicians to write prescriptions for marijuana for medicinal purposes. 
And so many states started doing that, that now the federal government has taken the position that uh, they're going to stop enforcing federal marijuana statutes in those states for people who have prescriptions. Um, so this was a not a state directly challenging the extra, the uh, enforcement of the federal statute. Rather, it was the state putting up their own legal system, and which was in conflict with the federal system. Um, so, most recently, this matter has come up with the uh, Health Care Act and its provisions for mandatory insurance uh, to be paid for with mandatory premiums that you either, you either buy insurance from one of the approved carriers or the IRS will collect an amount of money from you to pay for probably government you know, medical care. Well, a lot of people said, well, this is unconstitutional. Uh, Congress does not have the authority to require people to buy private health insurance. It led to several lawsuits being filed, and it has also led to some state legislators introducing bills to do such things as making it a crime for an IRS agent to collect a mandated insurance premium. Um, both approaches have serious flaws, mainly because both of them were written at a time before Congress actually passed the bill. And when they passed the bill, they did a couple of things that are sort of clever and provide an example of the difficulty of, interpo of the state inter interposing its own actions against the federal actions. When Congress actually adopted the bill, they adopted a provi provisions which forbade or forbids the IRS from either levying or filing liens to collect the insurance premiums. Now, what this means is that they can't go after your bank account and they can't file a lien on your real estate to sell it at a public auction to collect the money. So of course you might say, well wait a minute, if they can't levy and they can't lien, then they probably can't collect the insurance premiums at all, so you know, where is the issue? But of course the problem is there are other ways they can collect it. If your employer withholds uh, wages for uh, to pay to taxes, and you go to apply for a refund, the IRS can hold out the insurance premium from that refund. If you get Social Security or any number of other benefits, they can withhold it from that. So uh, they have various ways of collecting. I've invented a few others, or just found a few others. Uh, they might not be able to levy on a bank on your account, but the Federal Reserve System can say, okay, when we issue currency to you, member bank, um, we're going to be withholding uh, about $800 here uh, because you have a, uh, someone with a bank account in your bank who uh, we can't otherwise collect the uh, premium from. So we're not levying on his account. We're just withholding $800 from the cash we're otherwise making available to you uh, as part of your membership in the Federal Reserve System. Now what is a bank going to do in that situation? The chances are, even though it's not a levy, 
they're liable to go to you and say, Mr. Account Holder, uh, the Federal Reserve is withholding 800 bucks from us, so we're going to have to uh, charge your account the amount. Uh, we're, uh, we've amended your uh, bank account contract so that we can do that. We'll call it a, uh, uh, a fee. We don't know what to call, we just call it an XYZ fee. Be one of the fees we charge for your bank account. Um, you know, what is the guy going to do about that? You, you put the IRS agent in jail for doing that? No, the IRS agent is probably not even in the, in the state. He may be a clerk, in, an anonymous clerk in uh, their main office in uh, Martinsburg, West Virginia. Um, you might not know, even know who he is. Even the IRS might not know who it is. So uh, we come down to the problem that by s the IRS and the Congress have ways of so structuring any effort to collect money that they can always, almost always find a way to get it without ever having an agent come knocking on your door or on your bank's door or filing anything with your county clerk or doing anything as direct as that. So what it really comes down to is about the only way you could effectively challenge this usurpation would be to go after the entire income tax system. And the lawyers and others, the legislators, who uh, contemplate doing this kind of thing, said, now wait a minute, going after the entire income tax system, the IRS, everything, is a little bit too much for us to handle right now. Uh, the lawyers who are contemplating the litigation are finding, as I keep pointing out to them, that the same arguments that you have to make to deal with insurance mandates are the same arguments that also apply to uh, the income tax, to Social Security, to Medicare, to the whole, whole bit. You cannot really distinguish the one from the other. <coughs> and uh, they don't like it. But every time they come back with a counter argument, I show them, show them. <coughs> I show them how they're wrong. And of course, the thing is that some of them, have, including friends of mine, have gotten upset with me about that. But I said, "Look, I'm only making arguments the opposition is going to make anyway. I'm not discovering anything that." They're not going to find out by themselves. It's better for you to plan legal strategies that can survive everything the opposition can come up with. That's just good basic lawyering. And if you don't anticipate the arguments they're going to make, they're going to nail you when it comes to court. So uh, that's where that discussion is going now. Um, I'm in touch with a lot of these guys. We're engaged in a debate on almost a daily, a daily basis. But it, what it comes down to is that the simple, obvious, direct approach of just making a law, making it a crime to, uh, for some federal agent to do something or other, generally is not going to work. What a, a lot of people don't realize, there's a old statute, it goes back to 1815, that allows a, a state action against a federal official or agent to be removed to federal court. So for example, in uh, Idaho, when a, when a federal agent shot uh, Vicki Weaver, killed her, and, their, her, and her son, the uh, district attorney 
of that county uh, filed charges of manslaughter against the federal agent. And uh, it, it, it was probably only about a day or two the, the federal agents immediately removed the case to federal court where it was summarily di dismissed on the grounds that the federal agent was performing his official duties and therefore was immune. <clears throat> now, what does it take to remo remove a state case, federal court? Federal court? <clears throat> the answer is not much. I've done it myself in cases. You just simply file a pleading with federal court, copy to the state court, saying removal, and say, I'm hereby remo removing this case to federal court. And then it's up to the federal judge to decide what to do with it. In the meantime, the, st the state court is blocked. It can't proceed. And they have to wait for the federal court to decide whether to keep the case and perhaps decide it, or remand it back to state court for the state court to take it up. Well, the standard practice has developed for doing this for all state criminal charges against federal agents. Uh, we could imagine a federal agent murdering his wife, and if he claimed he was doing it while on duty, uh, the very likely result would be that they would be removed to federal court summarily dismissed. He was on duty when he married, m murdered his wife. You know, end of charge. So uh, now he might be subjected to disciplinary action. You know, this agency might say, well, now wait a minute. You know, murdering your wife is embarrassing the department. We're going to put you on unpaid leave for, oh, a week. But uh, unless they really decide to go after him, the chances are he can get away with it. So, uh, this immunization of federal agents is a major obstacle. And it, it is, puts a, out of reach a lot of the remedies that people might expect to be able to use in, in, the, in, the, uh, in a legislative effort at the state level. <coughs> So what else can be done? Well, turns out there are a lot of things that can be done. Um, what I have proposed is not a piecemeal, one legislative act at a time approach to the problem of federal usurpation. There are just too many of them. They happen too fast, especially for a state like Texas, where the legislature only meets for 140 days every two years. There's just no way that a state legislature can keep up with the onslaught of federal usurpations. It has to be, able, especially when uh, it can't even attend to most of the business it feels it needs to attend to within the, le the legislative session. Most bills that eventually make it through the legislature have been in the works for at least three or four legislative sessions. It can take that long before they finally build up enough support to make it onto the floor and get passed. Assuming, of course, that they then survive the governor's veto. So getting legislation adopted in the Texas legislature takes a, can take a long time and a lot of work, even if it's uncontroversial. It, it's possible that you get the support of a few key committee chairmen to get a provision put in here, provision put in there, and as long as there's no opposition to it, the chances are you can get it through. But if there's any kind of opposition, chances are it's not going to make it. 
So what can we do to provide an effective bulwark against federal usurpations? And what I proposed is to create a kind of grand jury that can hear citizen complaints about federal usurpations. And the, that grand jury, if it decided that the federal action was in fact unconstitutional, could issue a report saying that. That's all it could do. If it thought that it was constitutional, it just wouldn't do anything. It's only if it finds it unconstitutional that it can issue a report saying that it's unconstitutional. But once it does that, then the rest of the Texas Constitutional Amendment, because this would be a Texas Constitutional Amendment, would do is to require all federal, I mean all state officials and agents and contractors to refuse to cooperate with that unconstitutional federal action uh, with the penalty that they lose their jobs if they cooperate. Right now, the, the, the law on the books is that if you violate a federal law, you lose your job. This would reverse that. First of all, it would be effectively be saying that uh, if the, this grand jury that I call a nullification commission, uh, or Federal Action Review, Review Commission, or its formal name, if it decides that a federal action is unconstitutional, it's saying, in effect, it's not a law. And therefore, you can't be fired for disobeying it. In fact, you can be fired for obeying it. So, what could co-op? non-cooperation then consist of. And there's where we need to start being a little bit creative. A lot will depend on what kind of usurpation it is. Not all federal usurpations lend themselves to uh, nullification at the st state level. Uh, I have some examples here of where this is a problem. We need to examine each kind of usurpation for what it is, what is the alleged authority for it that the proponents of it are, uh, you know, asserting, how it's impacting on people, uh, and what kind of cooperation is required at the state level to carry it out, if any. Uh, and the intervention points available with and without the Nullification Commission and likely scenarios for how it would unfold thereafter. So you have to plan these things out step by step by step. You know, what, what would, if you did this, what would happen? Uh, what would be a likely response? What would you do next? What would you do after that? And so forth, step by step. I already went over some historical examples. The Real ID Act, how it was resisted. Now, if we had a nullification commission, how would the Real ID Act been, have been dealt with? Well, first of all, a citizen could have complained to the nullification commission before the Real ID Act was even passed. The, the Nullification Commission is not a court. Uh, so we don't have to wait for injury to be done or an actual case. And uh, if it, even if it found the act had not been passed yet, it conduct conduct he hearings and call witnesses. And the proponents would have to con confront opponents in the Nullification Commission, not just in Congress. So it could be, if they had, every state had one, these debates could be conducted at the state level and likely to have an impact on Congress. So as we move on to different types of measures, 
some things are too big to take on by nullification commission right off the bat. But it could break them up into little pieces and deal with each little piece one after another. So, uh, hello, I'm sorry about that. You want to get anything out of the way? Yeah, we're done. Okay. So, uh, he's, fix, he's strategizing how to break up these big usurpations into little usurpations that can be whittled whittle away at one piece at a time and gradually building up a momentum for dealing with the larger problems. So the nullification commission idea is a fairly complex proposal. It's not a simple, direct, obvious one, but if it's done right, it could go a long way toward turning the situation around by mobilizing public opinion, by mobilizing public action, and uh, generally changing the civic and political culture of the country, which is ultimately what has to be done. So, so I got a note that the restaurant is closing, so uh, we probably need to pack it up here. Uh, I can start packing while some of you guys are asking questions. If you could hit the red button again to turn it off, then that can conclude the table.